We're live. Hey, what's that? Dan's ready? Dan's all set. I guess we could get started. <laughs> all right, let me... I, there were a few questions that were entered beforehand. So I'm not going to do any kind of elaborate intro like we typically do for the lives. But I did uh, figure we should have some collectibles and some art. Given it is a collector art house. And the greatest card in the alpha set. The artist card. So let me go to... What we're going to do here, I guess I will intro with that. What we're going to do is just have a general Q&A. Anything that is um, related to sorcery in some way. So no questions are off limits. I guess I could, uh, you know, dance and dodge some that might be off color or, uh, you know, inappropriate given a dance here. <laughs> or, uh, you know, but generally speaking, I'm open to anything. And uh, just drop a comment in the chat. And then I will put it up on the screen. I think I could probably figure that out. And then, um, yeah, we'll just we'll just talk about sorcery stuff. So let me go to the Discord. Uh, Sean very graciously collated a list of questions that were asked before we got started. So I'll start there if nobody wants to jump in with anything. If you guys are on Facebook, as a reminder, you can do the little clicks to get into StreamYard and allow them to share your name if you want to. Otherwise, you'll only come up as Facebook user. Um, if you're on YouTube, then it will show your name. So you guys can submit questions in either place. It should be live multicasting. And hey, what's up, Cosmic? Um, we're multicasting across a few of my Facebook groups and also um, on YouTube, of course. So you can submit questions in any of those places and then it'll go to the chat here and then I'll throw them up on a screen and get into it. So what I was doing, I'm getting distracted here. If you guys want to say hello in the chat and identify yourself, um, please do so. In the meantime, I'm gonna to go to the list of questions. And we got about 12 people so far. If there are more, if there is interest in kind of, um, I know there's some general questions about like how I got interested in sorcery and uh, things like that. We can get into that if you'd like. Otherwise we can talk about things going on with the game. But um, let me see here. So Cosmic's at work. 13 people. All right. Let me, let me show what I'm looking at on the screen here. So share screen. And then we're going to go to second monitor. And these were the questions. Again, thanks to Sean for pulling this together. These were the pre-stage questions that people asked in the Collector Art House Discord. I don't know that any came through on Facebook. I forgot if I asked for them on Facebook. But... Um, so we've been in, in terms of personal questions, collector art house related, sorcery related, and art specific. Uh, so I'll start here until we get into, unless anybody um, drops one in chat, I'll start with the list here. You are like an engineer or some nonsense in real life. How did you end up going down that path? Uh, <laughs> well, so I actually, I think I talked about this in one of my lives previously, where I actually started in college as a um, architecture major. I forget if I talked about this on a live stream or there was one time I had a, um, a call with Eric and Simon and I was giving them a little bit about my background and I had told them about how I started in as an architecture degree. And um, like the way it worked is the first year of that program, it was very art art related. Like you had to be very artistic in terms of like drawing and painting and things like that. And um, I had thought it would just be all CAD uh, drawing, which is like a digital mechanical drawing, you know, like drawing buildings and, um, you know, building structures, windows, door features, designing a building, right? Um, using a digital tool. So, but, you know, I guess the intent was to kind of... Um, challenge people artistically since uh, architecture is you know both artistic and mathematical you know and uh civil engineering and structuring structure of a building and whatnot so anyway i lasted one semester in that because i had no artistic chops whatsoever and uh we were in a studio and we had to do like all these like really artsy things like draw and paint and get up in front of the class and explain our concept and i remember one example they the teacher wanted us to do a salvador dali <laughs> themed uh, piece of art and um, so I just like did something ridiculous. It looked like like a five year old child had done it. And like, not that I half asked it, I just didn't have any like technical ability artistically. Um, so it kind of like hardened me a little bit. Like I had to get up in front of the class and um, show it. And she was like, 
I remember she was kind of like a hard ass and she was like, what does this have to do with Dolly? <laughs> and I, so I started like BSing a little bit and explaining like uh, how I thought it like fit. And, um, you know, I kind of challenged her on it. It was kind of funny. And uh, some of the kids in the class came up to me afterwards because these kids were like great artists. And they came up to me after and she was like, oh, they were like, oh, man, that was pretty Bush League of the teacher. Like you handled it well. Like, you know, you're doing good. Good job. They encouraged me. <laughs> so I did that for a while. And then I decided to uh, change majors. Um, and I did uh, electrical engineering undergraduate. And then like a year or two out of college, I did uh, uh, MBA, Master of Business Administration degree with a focus in new ventures and entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. Um, so I like business. I like stock market investing and things like that. Um, so I kind of have like a hybrid academic skill set in that sense, I guess I would say. Um, next one is what can Eric do within sorcery to get you to forgive him for the troll curios? <laughs> so that's kind of a meme on the channel. Yeah. So like the curios, I mean, I love the curios as a concept fundamentally. Um, when it was first released in Kickstarter, and I could go to the Kickstarter page, but a lot of you guys were here from the beginning, or if you were, if you were not, what happened was during the Kickstarter campaign, I think it was when they hit the $1 million uh, milestone stretch goal, they announced this idea of curios. And they said, we're going to we're gonna add these additional cards into the set <clears throat> that will be like very rare to pull, right? They gave very little information about it, but they said... The way they worded it was very brief. It was like one or two sentences. And they said that they would, it would have like some historical significance. Uh, I don't know if they use the word historical, but it was like rel relevant to the early development of the game. Um, so I thought that was an awesome idea. And just like fundamentally, I thought it was really cool that like they would not say um, what the cards were. And their their strategic intent there was to reinvoke that early 90s um, TCG era, you know, like for us, like playing magic in the early nineties, we didn't have the internet really. I mean, most people didn't have computers or like high speed internet, certainly. So we would get like scry magazine and, um, what were some of the others, like some of these like magazines, right. That had like price guides and stuff. And like in sports cars, they'd have price price guides and they'd have like the set list in these magazines. You couldn't just go on the internet and find pricing or even the set list. So I think that was the fundamental concept and idea behind Curios. You know, it it, it was a way to um, reinvigorate that like old nostalgic sense of discovery through the pack opening experience. You didn't know what you'd find. And then like, I'm actually showing a bunch of Curios here, right? So like cards like these, we didn't know they'd be in the set. And then they'd have something really interesting and uh, historical related to development of the game, which is cool because people that are like really passionate about the project love products like this, you know, the early Curio cards, um, you know, other names for what the game was before Gridlord was one of those they had contemplated. And then also like the sample cards, you know, because there was a lot of design change from that. So I loved like all the Curios you're seeing here. Like I have several of the Alpha Curios, you know, the Grim Tangle, the Murder of Crows, Sidewine from Macau is great. Bloom of Frogs. Uh, the nine piece is, is epic. I did like a, a detailed article on this one and why these nine and like what the art concept and gameplay, game mechanics type concepts behind those nine pieces were. So all this great stuff, right? Um, I love that aspect of Curios, the, the mystery of the discovery and the historical significance. I was not wild about the, the, the more meme like related ones. So like the troll, the boss troll, the bridge troll, and uh, what's the third troll? There's three trolls, right? Um, and on the back, instead of an Eric's Curiosa, let me see, do I want it to clear back? Yeah, an Eric's Curiosa game, it says an Eric's Curio game. You know, and I, I was like, all right, you know, that's cute, it's fun. Like, obviously the company's having fun. Uh, they're making light of, light of it or whatever. But I thought it was like a deviation, yeah, bridge troll, thank you. I thought it was a deviation from the essence of relating to the historical development of the game, you know, and, to, and, uh, to be fair, I guess they, they didn't say, um, they were very cryptic about what, what a curio actually is. They didn't give us a definition other than say it would have some historical relevance, the one liner in the Kickstarter campaign. Um, and they didn't like commit to the bounds of it. Like how, like, you know, we were, we were doing all kinds of speculation in the early days. We thought it could be title change because Eric was very active in the Discord very early on. Um, there was only like a handful of us in the Discord when he first opened it. And he was very active in there. 
Um, cause it was a couple, it was probably a, at least a year or two preceding the Kickstarter launch. And he was talking about how like, you'd have to look very closely at the curios cause it'd be very subtle in some cases. And we've seen that with some of the artistic changes. Like one that comes to mind is devil's egg, which has the two, um, shadow figures to the left of the egg. And, um, it's clear that like when he designed that card, he zoomed in on the egg to give it a, a, a sharp focal point. Like typically in game design, you have a very focused, um, specific focal point. And that's very um, true in sorcery too, where he wants you to look at the card and just know immediately just by looking at it, uh, what it would do. Right. So it's not like overcrowded. If, if you zoomed out, out on this, it would, it would really lose the essence of what that card was intended to do within the gameplay. Um, so in the devil's egg, like he had a more zoomed in view and then in the curio, it has a more zoomed out view and you get a better sense of the painting that Brian Smith did for that card. So all curios like that, I loved the meme ones. I thought it'd be better if they only memed with one of the, the trolls, but I guess it was like a meme upon a meme, uh, to make three, all trolls like are, are have meme potential as uh, curios. And then like, you know, in beta, there was a bunch of stuff like that. So I just, uh, you know, joke around on the channel. Yo, what's up, Marco? We got uh, Wicked Nerds. <laughs> Wait, Get Wreck Nerds. <laughs> so we got Kyle coming in on Facebook. We always know he uses the Get, the get Wreck moniker. All right, so I think um, Curios is a great concept still. I would rather they make it more serious. Like, so I would say for Alpha and Beta, it is what it is. You know, a lot of them do have historical relevance to the, the early development of the game, and I think that's amazing. I think as they go forward, now it's like an interesting balance, right? Cause like you probably don't need to belabor the early development of the game as much. I would, I love like researching that and telling those stories on my channel. I mean, maybe let the content creators kind of dig into that. And I love if Eric and Simon and Chase and those guys would like give me more material. I've scoured the internet. I've taught, I've built relationships with many of the artists, of course. And just in talking with them, I learned a lot about the historical, um, like their concepts, their early design concepts and their approach to coming up with the art, the art concept for the cards. Um, but I think there's probably a lot in Eric's head and Nick Reynolds and, um, you know, those guys and maybe even like files on their computers that uh, maybe they could share with me to help, uh, I guess, proliferate that uh, knowledge uh, and insight into the his historical development of the game. And then with the Curio concept, expand that further and maybe delve more into these other fun new ideas, like going with really iconic historical artists. So we saw the Brom card that was done by Gerald Brom, um, who's like a you know huge name in fantasy art. And um, that was, uh, I think, the first and only card where we got a, su a surprise artist as a curio, and it made a huge impact. Everyone was stunned and shocked. It was kind of like when Kickstarter launched, um, not everybody knows this who wasn't around early on, but in week two, I think it was week two or three of the Kickstarter campaign is when Rudy came on. So that, that, um, relationship was not known. Eric had dropped hints that he had reached out to him. He was saying things like, oh, I don't know if he's interested or not yet, but really the, um, underrated aspect of that debut video from Rudy was that he revealed the Frank Frazetta licensing agreements and that there would be Frazetta cards in this product. So that was like a really big deal. Um, for those not into art as much, uh, Frank Frazetta is really like a, uh, person that really, um, paved the way for fantasy art, like put it on a, on a much larger stage. And, um, so he's like a real icon in the fantasy art genre. So to have his cards in that in Alpha was big. And then to have someone like Gerald Brom as a surprise artist was a big deal. Um, so that was revealed like when we discovered it in a, in a card, a curio card in Alpha. So I think there's potential there um, to go with like big iconic artists as like a insert, you know, like a curio insert in these future sets like Arthurian Legends. Um, the Arthurian Legends theme has been explored by many artists across all types of art products and categories um, in the industry. So there's there's like endless possibilities of people he could reach out to and license one of their pieces, maybe go for another like iconic, well-known piece. The Brahm one was from Guardians, uh, is it CCG? Um, it was a Guardians card game, trading card game or collectible card game in the early 90s. Uh, and it was done by Keith Parkinson. So to have like, a, and Keith Parkinson's a guy that I think he passed away when he was like 41 or 42 of cancer, sadly. Um, but he created Guardians and a lot of his art was in that set. So to license one of his pieces as a future curio, I think would be 
a monster and a great idea. Um, let me see. <clears throat> what drew you to CCGs, TCGs as a kid? I don't know. I mean, like, <laughs> so like I laughing because like kids in my neighborhood were playing Dungeons and Dragons and these bastards. Like I, so I had like a friend. He had. We were. Uh, I was born in eighty one, so I'm be forty three this year. And like playing as a kid, um, I had a friend. He had like four four boys in the family. So he had three brothers. He was like the second youngest of the three. He had two older brothers. So we were like in elementary school and his older brother was in high school and he had this lawn business and he was just like raking in money, like cutting all the lawns in the neighborhood. And he was just buying like magic cards by the box, which was like unheard of like in these days. I would just go to the, you know, local game store and I would buy like couple packs of revised and you know legends was on the shelf and antiquities and this stuff for like 10 bucks and we we're like f you that's ridiculous <laughs> you know i was using like my uh my chores money from vacuuming the house and cleaning the bathrooms and stuff to buy a couple packs and this guy just have like page after page of all the power nines and all this stuff um so that really made an impression on me early on those guys were playing magic so i think that's how i got into playing magic as a kid and then they were, I was laughing because they were playing Dungeons and Dragons too. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, that looks like, all right. Like you guys are pulling all nighters, just hanging out, having a good time around the ping pong table in the basement. I was like, let me come play with you. And they're like, yeah, no problem. Like just read this, uh, what do they call those? Those dungeon manuals or some shit? He's like, read this book. And I was like, what do you mean read this book? And I was like, you, you tell me I got to read a book to play a game? And that was like a non-starter. I was like, no, there's no chance I'm reading a book. <laughs> so I was like, just tell me the rules. And like, you know, I'm smart enough. I'll figure it out, right? But the freaking guy, like my friend, he was like my best friend. He was like, no, you read the book, you play. You don't read the book, you're not playing. So I didn't read the book and I never played Dungeons and Dragons my entire life. And uh, I played Magic because it was like pretty simple to pick up. Um, but the guy would like freaking smash us with like Time Walk and Chaos Orb and all this like insane stuff. So that kind of mind effed me for life. And like I always looked up to this guy and uh, wanted to have like a great collection and, um, you know, have the means to buy more, like buy the box uh, or whatever. Collect original art wasn't a thing at all like in the early days. So there wasn't that. That was like kind of like a thing I got into you know, in my adult life a little more, but that's the gist of how I got into TCGs as a kid. So I played magic and then I moved, um, I was in Rochester, New York is where I grew up. And then like halfway through freshman year of high school, um, in Rochester, like a lot of people know that was the headquarters of Eastman Kodak, uh, you know, Kodak, the film and camera maker. And it was like at a time when, um, Fuji was going digital and Kodak was like real stubborn and they're like, nah, F digital. It's like a, it's a fad. No big deal. We're sticking with film. That's like the best technology, the purest technology, you know, best quality. We're sticking with that. We're not going digital. Um, so they were kind of like, you know, struggling as a, as a business. Uh, he got relocated to Philadelphia suburbs. So I moved to like Philly area freshman year of high school and I lost like all my childhood friends and I never played magic again in my life to this day. Uh, that was in like 1990. Shit, when was that? It must have been like 1996. Because I was, what, what are you, like 15 years old as a freshman? It must have been like 1996, 1997. So I played Magic for like a few years from like revised up until what, whatever it was, Ice Age or something. And then never again, never again. And then I remember like I was graduating high school in 99 and uh, Pokemon <laughs> came out. Like Watsy was putting out Pokemon. And I was like, oh, like Watsy, it's a Watsy trading card game. So I'll just go on eBay and I'll buy like a box of the base set Unlimited. And I got like two full sets of that, right? And I was like, I'll just put it like in my little toy chest in my room. And then like I literally for the past 20 years, like from uh, 99, I guess it was when that game came out till um, probably like 20... I don't know, 2018, 2019, 2020, when everything started blowing up, I had no idea that Pokemon even existed, let alone that like grown ass men were playing with these little pocket monsters and like super into collecting them. So I was like, hey, I think I got a little, I think I got some of those monsters. <laughs> so I like, I went up and visited my parents one weekend and I looked in the toy chest and I was like, yeah, I think I got a box of those and, uh, you know, some singles and stuff. So I got them out of this like old rickety shoe box and I had a sealed um, box of base set unlimited, which I still have. And um, it was almost like almost two complete sets minus like three like worthless commons. Um, so I had like the 16 foils, you know, with like Charizard and the other uh, 
the other little monsters. So, you know, and I looked it up on the internet and it was like worth like 10 grand. And I was like, holy shit, this is, this is wild. Let me see what else is going on with like magic and all this stuff. And, you know, modern magic didn't appeal to me at all. I didn't really want to go back to it. I was getting burnt out of the game anyway. Cause like I had no cash to keep buying it and they, they were putting out sets every three months or something. And I was like, there's no way I could keep up financially. And, you know, and then I moved and there was like no point. Right. So I just went cold Turkey. But then when I came back to it, I started messing around with like Hearthstone, like on a play lever, cause, level, cause I have kids, little young kids. So you could play fast. You could learn fast. It was no big deal. That kind of scratched the competitive itch to play. Uh, but then when sorcery came around, I was really enthralled with the original hand painted art, which was the initial hook. I still think it's the, the big hook for a lot of people, the artistic aspect of things. And, um, I really got into that. So I got into, um, you know, reaching out to the artist, uh, acquiring original paintings on a small level, which kind of snowballed in time and then going after, um, some of the other stuff like the curios and things, but <laughs> all right. Guys, if you have, I, mean, I could go off the list, but if you, if you want to interject a question, we can go astray here. So collector art house related, are there any embellished curio prints in the works? Um, embellished curio prints. So we've done like several embellished prints um, with Severin and Vincent Pompetti. And I have one with Drew Tucker that's about to launch probably later today. I just received those in the mail uh, yesterday. And... Um, I don't, no, no curio designs just yet. Um, we're probably, yeah. And I did like, I did embellish prints with Melissa Benson was a real honor and, and Elvira Shakarova, you know, one of the, one of the great, great new artists in sorcery. Um, yeah, I don't, I, maybe, but, uh, not imminent, I'd say. All right. How about triptych prints? I like the idea. So I did, can we please get an, an Oasis pristine paradise playmat or two player vertical diptych? site playmat yeah so playmats is something i've thought about and considered the thing is like the company teased something about playmats and i thought it related to the dust system we don't know like what's going on exactly with the dust system there were those promos that were shown and then there was like a handful of like new playmats which i think the concept was that those would be part of dust rewards so although i'm interested in doing playmats with a lot of the artists that i that i work with um, I've been dragging my feet on it and we've been kind of waiting because we don't want to step on the company's to toes for two reasons. One, like out of respect for the company, they probably have plans for what they want to do with um, playmats. So I don't want to be duplicative with that. And then also it would hurt uh, myself and the artists if we printed like a ton of playmats of some artwork and then they did like an official one through the company. So if anything, it might be, yeah, like a new creative concept. So Marta and, and I did this collaboration where I had this idea, like Marta Molina, Elvira Shakarova and Kyle Calzans were came up through the altars scene, right? Magic the Gathering altars, they really were doing very well there, became very popular. And that's how Eric discovered them for sorcery. So I had this idea uh, of like, why, why limit it to just altering a card? Why don't we come up with concepts that bridge actual gameplay in, artistic, in an artistic way, right? So you could take two artworks and merge them through an embellished print. So it's basically like a, a full scale altar, like on a print, you can make an, an altar basically. And do, that's, that's essentially what an embellished print is in a way. Um, but we took it a step beyond with Marta and we did a point, a painting and you see like Mikhail Nagy Paul's doing a lot of this with his artist proofs these days, um, really merging like two concepts of his cards. But with Marta, we did the Oasis and the pristine paradise in this like diptych, I guess it's called, <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's like, it's, it was a landscape wide format, uh, paper art paper that she did this painting on and it had oasis and pristine paradise next to each other in this beautiful landscape that merged the two and actually i came up with that idea from a uh, donato giancarlo um painting that he did with the five lands from magic the gathering which he did like in one very large long landscape he's really known for his large format uh, paintings like that and um, so I said to Marta, like, let's take two of your Atlas site lands and make this dual land, like, because you're great at landscapes. And I've seen you do altars and cards where you have um, two cards like next to each other and do this beautiful 
um, landscape. So we did that as a painting. We did, I think we did like a couple different variants like that and it came out absolutely stunning. Um, so yeah, there'll probably be more of that, uh, both as paintings and uh, embellished prints potentially and alter concepts and things. Will we ever see a spellcraft card auction? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. As some of you might know, I really um, very rarely sell my own stuff. I um, I work with the artists as kind of like a representative slash agent uh, capacity um, or just to assist uh, in sales or more than that, like really what I'm passionate about is um, helping create a stage showcasing the work of the artist, developing their brand and visibility and appreciation and value for their work. So it occurred to me, like after I had these platforms across various Facebook pages, uh, my Discord, um, my website, I did a lot of artist interviews and Q and A's and I was like, hey, I could help artists beyond just like, I, I just did the Q and A's out of like pure passion and desire and curiosity to learn about their background, their process, their influences. And I thought it would be a tremendous benefit to both them, the company and piquing my own curiosity and interest to do these interviews with them. So I did that with about, I don't know, 12 to 15 artists, I think. If you go to collectorarthouse.com, uh, there's a interviews and articles um, site and you find all those art uh, interviews that, that we did. And, um, you know, I just thought like after that, I had done like a dozen of those, right? And I was like, you know, I could probably work with these artists and leverage the communities and platforms I, I had grown to showcase their art on a grander scale. And again, really help um, create visibility for their work, uh, really connect them in a unique way that you don't really see. <clears throat> At least I haven't really seen in other TCGs where the artists are like fully embraced into the community. They're in the Facebook community group, they're in the discords, they're engaging, they're responding to fans comments and reacting to them. And it's just like a lot of fun. We get to know who they are as people. So when we collect the cards and their artwork, whether it be a print or a painting or on any level sketch, um, we appreciate it because we like them as people, you know, and it like enhances the art in a way. Like we, we know <clears throat> who they are, what has influenced them, um, what they're about, like artists all over the world, culturally different. Um, it just becomes a lot more uh, fun and exciting. So spellcraft cards, uh, I don't know how I got on that tangent, but um, yeah, I acquired those like a long while back. Hey, what's up, Greg? Um, yeah, so I'll let me let me show one really quick. While we're on the subject, <laughs> <laughs> so there were these cards. Let's find a let's find a spicy one here for you. All right. This is a great one that I always enjoy showing because I assume we are very likely to see this in a, hang on a second here, guys. All right, let's do this. So spellcraft cards, right? So on the back, this is what they're talking about. This was an early design concept. So it's the same. Let me show you Relentless Crowd, right? So this was like one of the, this is the first promo there ever was for Sorcery. And on the back, you have this artwork from Francesca Berald, right? So before this was decided on, they had this variant of it, which more closely um, resembles her original painting for this with this very, very detailed, um, ornate border, right? So she is tremendously talented. She does these amazing borders for maps all the time, right? So that's where kind of she draws that. Elvira Shekharova is also really great at doing this with gilding and coming up with these elaborate fancy borders. Um, so the spellcraft is very striking, you know, and that was like an early uh, name that was contemplated for the game. And ultimately they went with Sorcery Contested Realm. But this is a really interesting piece of history. I, you know, through like the different things I do, I just naturally network and connect with a lot of people. And I stumbled upon someone who was involved in a project very early on. And uh, he started showing like some old cards. And he was like, hey, I helped with like the type line text for the cards and different aspects. He had worked with Eric before. I think he's written articles for Legend Story Studios for Flesh and Blood and stuff like that. Um, so he had these cards and you could see they're just like home printed. You know, these aren't the like printed at the Chinese factory. Um, they were printed, I think, by himself or potentially by Eric in New Zealand when they were doing early play testing and development of the card. And here's like an early concept card. And it has a lot of the elements of the curios, right? You got Fiery Inferno, 
Um, that's that card doesn't exist yet, right? It's early development. This is a Brian Smith artwork. He called it uh, genocide. <laughs> was the name of it when it was commissioned? Um, but it, you know, when it went to print, I guess Eric decided to change the name to Fiery Inferno, or at least on his print files. But it has this legendary mechanic, like some of the curios do, right? Like here, here's a Drew Tucker um, Belfry curio, legendary sight, right? So it's got that legendary uh, moniker. And um, anyway, that's what the Spellcraft cards are. The guy just had like a bunch of these. And I was like, dude, I'd love to have those. I'm, I'm a real big, I guess, Uber fan, according to Chase now. He said I was a super fan. Now I'm an Uber fan. Um, so I was a huge like into the game, like really passionate about it. I top pledged to Kickstarter and I've been like all in on day one, just like super into it. So I was like, dude, like... I, I'm not, I'm not going to be trying to flip those or resell those. I just need to own some of those, you know, any of them. And uh, at first he was like, no, no, you know, and he was like uncomfortable. He didn't want to, I, I didn't like offer like a fortune for it. I was like, I don't even know how to value something like that because it's not printed. It's not like a real test print card per se. Um, so I was just telling him like, I would just love to own it for my binder. And as a historian of this game, like it just means the world to me. So finally, he ended up coming back and saying, like, yeah, you know, I think I could let him go. And uh, very nice of him and gracious that we could work something out and was able to get those. So, no, I don't plan on auctioning them. <laughs> Long story short. Not anytime soon, and who knows if ever. Like, I really hate uh, selling my own stuff. So, let's see. All right, so our first question was, what's a Spellcraft card? <laughs> Oh, yo, Dan, what's up, man? Yo, Dan, so you posted something for sale in my Discord, and the guys were saying they haven't heard from you since August of 2023. So if, you're, if you still got some sample cards, I think it was, for sale, uh, some of the guys were interested if you want to go check out the Collector Art House Discord. Um, all right, so let's see. Is there anything besides the art that motivates you to run your sorcery communities? Uh... <laughs> Anything besides the art. Let me think about that. I, I didn't really think about these questions at all previously. It's kind of funny. Is there anything besides the art that motivates you to run your sorcery communities? Well, I love. I was just saying, you know, I love the project, right? So um, it wasn't always all about the art, and it's still not really. You know, like I do love the product. I love the cards. I love these curios. I love the sample cards. Um, the uncut sheets. I mean, I'm, t I'm rattling off all the unconventional, rare, <laughs> and unique products. But, um, you know, it's a great game. I have played the game. I thought it was amazing. Um, I didn't really... Uh, I can't play it regularly because I have three little kids, you know? So my time is extremely limited. So I really got to pick and choose how I allocate my time and the things I could do. And given all the communities I manage and um, working with the artists and doing consignment and all these different things and projects, right? Like I got to dedicate myself to that, um, especially with working uh, with the artists. You know, I would be doing them an injustice if I did not put my all into that. Um, so what, yeah, I, I got to say, like, it's very intrinsically motivating to spend the time that ultimately helps them and it helps collectors at the same time because it makes their work special and valuable and that's important as a collector. You want their work to have meaning. Um, it just feels better if it's unique and special and high quality and uh, just like more people are passionate in it. That's what makes like communities fun, TCGs fun. It's not like it's a game that it's not a it's not solitaire uh, like a game you play with yourself. It's like about fundamentally engaging with others and that experience you have and like the feeling you get from it and whatnot. Right. So um, yeah, the communities are fun. Like I love like networking i've met people like all over the world which is really wild i mean facebook is great for that especially but in the discords too like people are represented represented all over the world i know dan's like overseas you know we got like a, like probably several europeans watching not all of you guys have commented yet but we're not just in the u.s the u.s is the largest market but some of the greatest people i've met are like out there in europe you know south america um all over the world this is freaking amazing you know it's like bringing the world together and great people, real passionate uh, people. Um, let me see. How would you feel about two sets per year instead of one? 
Uh, I think that would be pretty nice. <laughs> I think, uh, well, actually, let me think about that. So one per year right now, it feels like it feels rough for the collector segment. I think the, I think it's no problem so far for the players because it's a very large set, over 400 cards. And keep in mind, like a lot of us early adopters, like we're feeling it the most, right? It feels more than the year because I've been into this game since like, what, four years or something, since like 2020-ish. Um, so it feels like I've waited four or five years for Arthurian Legends in a way. Uh, I waited a couple years for the Alpha and then Beta, but Beta is like largely a reprint of Alpha, right? Except for the Curios and the new Frazetta uh, replacement artwork and the new Avatar artwork. Um, so it feels long right now. So I don't know that we have a true feeling of what once a year feels like is my point, I guess. And I think we're going to have mini sets. And I think like for, you know, the first one we'll probably see is the Ed Beard Jr., mini set, which I hope and presume will come sometime between Arthurian Legends and whatever set is, whatever main primary set is to come next. So I think that will fill a void and be very fresh and uh, rejuvenate the market and retain interest. Something we're struggling with right now with these kind of like goals that people sometimes feel with engagement and excitement and interest. Um, I think that will can potentially be largely resolved with at least one mini set in between. But I think there's a potential once the company really figures out logistics and supply chain and some of the business aspects of uh, running this operation, I think there could be multiple mini sets per year. So maybe one core set and potentially maybe we'll have multiple, maybe two. I don't think it'll be a lot, but maybe you could have two per year and that would really help fill the void between sets. Um, again, like if they're large sets, I don't think it's a problem yet on the game player side, but on the collector side and really on the business side, it's difficult on stores because they don't have product right now. Um, so it's really hard to get traction with LGSs, I think, for that reason. And uh, to really run a viable business when you don't have great visibility into release cadence and um, the ramp cycle to plan events and to effectively market the product and sustain your community. It's really hard sustaining the community without um, product, which is more of a problem in Europe than the US. But even in the US, it's challenging not having distributor pricing and having to buy at MSRP from Team Covenant. Um, you know, there's some, there's some business uh, challenges in that, I think, that kind of thwart growth in a way, potential with uh, proliferating the retail network. Um, but there's great demand uh, for sorcery. So I don't know. It's a function of the team sizing. They can't really, I don't think they could do more sets even if they wanted to at this juncture. But in the future, I think that's something we could see evolve uh, if and when the team grows and uh, perhaps as a first step with more mini sets as opposed to main sets, just because of the logistics of printing on a smaller scale and um, exploring, you know, testing gameplay and all that kind of stuff that's challenging at this time with a very small team. All right. So we're getting some action in the chat. I'll, I'll stray from the Word document for a moment and we'll just go with chat. <laughs> I'll, just do, I'll just do that for now. All right, so let's see. Two is better. Three would be okay for me too. Three sets. Well, three's a lot. I think like two, I wouldn't want to see more than two. I think a slower cadence is, there's a lot of benefits to that. And that's smart. Um, one feels, I, I don't know. I just gave all the reasons why one is, is a challenge at the moment, but that could evolve. All right, let's see. It is basically a one and done, even, even if it is a product with a gambling aspect. Oh, wait, what difference do mini sets realistically make for collectors? Um, yeah, yet to be seen. I mean, like, so the presumption is, hang on. The presumption is a mini set is like 10 cards, right? So uh, you could argue, like, what difference could 10 cards make on a game player uh, level, too? But... You know, if it has new avatars with like dramatically different fundamental abilities that are synergistic with the existing card base um, or really like meta relevant cards that would see high use in many decks, it could have a lot of impact on gameplay. But your question is, what realistically would it make for collectors? It really um, that that is where Eric is going to have a 
creative challenge to make it, I think, and I think he will find a way somehow, some ways very, if any, if, if Eric's great at anything, it's that he's a creative genius <laughs> and I bet he's got some ideas on how to make this very appealing to collectors and uh, game players. And why? Because look at how they designed Alpha. I mean, Alpha has many brilliant layers of collectability. It has... For for one, the foils being extremely rare. Um, we don't know the print run of beta, but it still feels very challenging and rare to collect all of the foils and to pull all the foils in the pack opening experience. You got the curios. So he understands the essence of chase cards in a way that um, makes it not like too wildly unattainable, but you know, it creates chase for the collector side without impacting the players. And it, it preserves value in the sealed product and in singles. So I think he, they hit that balance very well between the foil rarity and um, the curio uh, concept. So with the mini sets, I would imagine there's likely to be some aspect of collectability introduced those introduced with those. I don't think they'll be purely a player product, or maybe there will be other supplemental products built around it. I mean, if you're an Ed Bear Jr.'s Patreon and you've seen his artwork, it's like absolutely stunning and i know the artists own the copyrights so ed can and will do whatever he wants with those paintings um and like you know make products with those but you've seen a precedence where that does not mean that eric's curiosa is completely shut out from finding ways to create accessory products and monetizing those products beyond just the cards because they've sold playmats themselves right playmats is the first example um, and I guess promo cards, you could argue is perhaps another example. So there must be a clause in their agreement that they can use them for marketing purposes or, um, other products like, uh, the crown promo from Elvira was an example. Right. And, um, I think was that, that was the promo card, right? Or there's the, um, I thought there was no, maybe there wasn't a crown promo crown of the victor. That was supposed to be the painting. <laughs> so the, uh, there was a, the crown, uh, was embedded in it was a as a what did I freaking call it uh the the, the the foil aspect thing uh shit I'm blanking on the word inside the text box there it had the little crown right but anyway they can make deal arrangements with these artists however they want you know maybe they'll cut a deal for playmats with Ed's art maybe they'll do something else uh sell some kind of special print or playmats and you know all types of things right so there'll be collectible aspects of it how do you establish collectability in a small card set that'd be an interesting challenge i think that's where uh eric has ideas he's kind of like hinted at having ideas for various things and of course he never gives us any details but um i think we'll see some innovation there somehow some way all right smash the like button yeah i always forget to say that if you guys could please i you know I usually get like not like a wild number of views on lives. I think uh, lives are hard to discover. Um, usually recorded content does much better. And um, but if you guys could like the video, it does help uh, get more viewership. We usually get like a few hundred on these lives. Um, so if you could do that, appreciate it and share the video in your networks. All right, let's see. Why hasn't the sorcery company commissioned more frogs from Nagy Pal? He's got great ideas. <laughs> well, how do we know he hasn't? I mean, look at the number of frogs in the alpha set, man. You forget, there's like the frog tokens. I got a, yeah, I don't want to grab it right now. I got a token uncut sheet, um, which is fucking, it's amazing. And it's got all Mikael's frogs on there, dude. You, you'd love it. But yeah, who knows? Maybe there'll be frogs in uh, Arthurian Legends. It's possible. All right. What else we got here? Um, has the number of cards in the beard mini set been confirmed? Uh, you guys answer that. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I can't remember exactly how the announcement came. So I'll just bite my tongue on that one. All right. A few weeks ago, I played altered TCG. Nah, I'm not, it's too long. It's too much to read. And you said altered TCG. So I'm out on that one. <laughs> We need a mechanic that allows frog tokens. All right. All right. You guys are, you guys, who knows what you guys are talking about anymore? 
Let's go back to the uh, the list here that Sean pulled together for us out of Discord. Collector Art House. Oh, whoa. bit of lag there. Hang on, guys. It's nice and legible, though, isn't it? Here we go. All right. All right. Um, is there anything? Oh, wait. No, I already answered that. How big of a time commitment is running Collector Art House stuff? Dude, you have no idea, man. So, like, I created the... Uh, I think the first thing I did, as I mentioned earlier, was the website, collectorarthouse.com. And I did that because I wanted to interview the artists. And I was like, you know, I wasn't like a guy that went to like a lot of art shows and conventions and stuff. So I, I, I didn't really like talk to a lot of artists and stuff. So I was like, you know what? Uh, no one else is doing this. I think this is like a great opportunity given the significance of art in this project. I think I'm like really passionate about that and think it's like, incredibly important project on an art level because there's very few anything that's doing 100% hand-painted traditional art nowadays. And with AI, it's become an increasing concern. The artists are very concerned about this. They're very upset about people, understandably so, about people violating their rights, their copyrights. Um, even in the alters community, people like freaking like violate copyright all the time. It's, it's real disaster. Um, so, you know, the fact that it was hand-painted traditional art I, getting back to the point of the question, I did the website because I wanted to interview the artists and I figured like they're probably very busy and pressed for time. I know like a lot are introverted, a lot like don't even speak English that well or at all. Like I, I talked to Vasily Ermolayov like on WhatsApp and stuff and he's using like a translator. It's very clear, you know, and I had him on the show when I did the, the beta showcase event, like he speaks no English. Um, so I had Elvira on and, and she translated a lot. You know, these artists are all over the world. A lot um, speak English as a second language so they can understand in writing, but they can't speak it as well. Um, but kudos to a lot of them. I had like almost all the artists came came on between my alpha box opening event and the beta opening event. And um, they all spoke English like tremendously well. I, I arranged for translators for a few of them. And then I was like totally blown away that it was completely not needed. <laughs> but, you know, some are like a little more quiet and introverted or they have language barriers and this and that. So I was like, you know what? And I wasn't doing it. I didn't have a YouTube channel like two years ago. I had none of this stuff. So I was like, I'll just create a website. I had no idea how to make a website. So I just like watched YouTube like a fiend. And then I created a website. I figured out the basics and I just used Wix, you know, Wix.com as a uh, tool without having to do any programming or just nonsense. Um, so I created like a basic functional website and I was like, I'll do just do written q and I'll submit 10 to 15 questions to the artist. I'll say, take as long time as you need. No problem. When you give me the responses and don't spend a lot of time too. just like be genuine, be from the heart. Tell me who your influences are and then I'll just go research them. So that's what I did. Some would have like a, few, a handful of influences. Some would give me like 10 and then I'd have to go like research. Uh, and I say have to, like it was, it was a lot of fun really. Cause I discover a lot of artists. I mean, several I knew of, but others I didn't as much. So I would like to start delving into all these different artists and influence them. And as I was looking through the portfolios of their influencers, it was really enlightening on how it influenced their work. You could really see it um, elements of their work, you know, like all these artists were selected because they're very unique in their own style. Um, but everything in life, you kind of like learn from others, right. And you innovate on that and draw inspiration from that and tailor it and tweak it. And, uh, it was evident in like a lot of the, the influencers that, that some of these artists, uh, referenced. So, you know, that took a lot of my time early on, uh, doing the interviews and I decided to do these like behind the art features as I called it. And as I got to know the artists, I started asking them more and more about their individual cards and art pieces and said, you know, tell me more about like, what was the art direction you got from Eric? And how did you, usually it was like one or two sentences, you know, and Eric's like, if you, any of you have like engaged with Eric, he's very brief, you know, especially in writing, like he'll give you like one or two sentences. And then if you try going back and forth, he's gone after like three points, you know? <laughs> so he just, he's like very to the point and he writes emails in that way too, even with the art direction to the artists. So they had like very high level direction to work with. And then they came up with the concept themselves. And sometimes they would do multiple sketches and submit them to Eric. And then he would select one and then, he, and then they'd run with it and paint with it. Um, and it became the art for the game. You know, so all that was very fascinating. I did that early on. And then I saw there was an opportunity to build some other social media platforms and um, really like showcase the artists and the game and all the interesting like development aspects of it on a grander scale. And I said, what better way to do that than a Facebook group? You know, cause I noticed like a lot of the other Facebook groups um, had like thousands of people, 
But so there was no sorcery Facebook group. And I created that. I created um, the community group in like January or no, I think it was first week of February in 2022. So it's been a little over two years and now it's like 3,700 people, which is incredible. Cause like several months ago, I remember looking like when cryptic was like a hot new indie game and, um, I don't know, some of these, like all these indies, I was looking up their, fa- their Facebook presence and they had like 100, 200, 300 members. And I was like, wow, we were at like a thousand members already on sorcery in a few months. So I was really proud of that. I was like posting every single day and trying to get the word out and trying to grow it. It was really helping the project get awareness. It was helping the artists get awareness. It was helping like bringing the, the fans and the community together so we could all have fun and enjoy it on a, on a grander level. And then I decided to um, add a Discord because I think community Discord is also important. There was really only the official Sorcery Discord and then like a marketplace Discord taking shape. And I was like, we need another community Discord um that's community run where we can talk without the lurking eyes of the company and we could be honest we can vent our frustration we can talk about whatever we want uh you know we so we're like civil and respectful to each other but we can debate and we can argue and we can um just be like fully transparent and honest about the pros and cons of the project and how we're feeling about it without company moderators uh, moderating that you know, so there's there's uh, an aspect to the official Discord that's really important, especially on a gameplay level. I think they're getting tremendous feedback there, um, but also just like the freedom of speech and like open um, communal aspect of a community run forum is really important too. So we have that in the Facebook group and also in the Collector Art House Discord. Um, but yeah, getting back to your question about how much of a time commitment is. It's like 24 seven, man. I mean, I have a full-time job too. So, you know, I put in an honest eight there. <clears throat> But then like around the clock, it's like all sorcery all the time. I'm on my phone a lot and just um, managing a lot of different things, talking to people on Facebook. I've posted there every single day for the past two years since I created it at least once, you know, written all these articles and, you know, done the Discord thing, several Facebook groups. So it's a lot. It's a lot of time, but it's it, I do it because it's fun and I'm passionate about it. If it wasn't fun, like why would I even do it at all? You know, <laughs> it would be like a chore, like another job, really which it, it kind of is in a way because there's an aspect to the consignment and the artist agent representation type stuff, but it's more than that. Like I love the product. I love like the paintings myself and I also collect and um, have played a little bit and hope to, you know, find a time someday to do more. All right. <clears throat> to shorten. Why? Oh, hang on. <laughs> so I'm oh, okay. So you gave me a shorter thing there, Dan. Why aren't there much more events organized by Eric's Curiosa? Um, I think it's just a, it's a function of uh, the life cycle of a new business. I mean, they have nine or 10 employees, you know, after uh, Ira left. I don't know that there were any ads after that. So that dropped them by one. Let's call it like eight to 10 employees, right? So we saw some execution challenges i mean they've made comments about how they're trying to proliferate their supply chain and deal with logistics and maybe look into i thought there was mention of looking into warehousing and stuff like that i mean they got to get um the fundamentals of the business really ironed out you know i think like eric is a serial entrepreneur he's done more than grinding gear games and path of exile he has other entrepreneurial efforts um, that aren't as well known. Um, so I think he is a smart business mind and obviously a creative genius. Like he was one of the, um, I th- he was the art director at Grinding Gear Games and Path of Exile. Um, so he's got an artistic mind. He's extremely creative and it sh- really shines in sorcery. Um, but every business needs to build a team around it, right? I mean, it's real. it's critically important to hire where you have weaknesses. Um, you know, maybe communication isn't his strength, I think it's fair to say. So you got to hire like a great communicator or a community engagement people and things like that, right? So there, there's all types of different aspects of running a business. There's the creative side, which Eric is amazing at. I think Nick Reynolds is like a really brilliant guy, great game designer. It was his his uh, grid-based concept was like the fundamental um, game concept, the underpinning of what the game is today. Um, and then they hired like a bunch of other people that I think like bring certain skills in certain areas, but they're not experienced in everything, right? So there's always in any kind of like business, but especially a startup, there's always talent gaps. 
Um, you're going to have, as you hire people, you're going to fill those gaps. You're going to address those weaknesses, but it takes time to address all of them and really improve and refine those on a grander scale. So I think the lack of events is a function of the team size and prioritization. It's much, Jack. Jack, go, go with mommy. Hello. You distracted me, buddy. Say hi and then, and then go downstairs. Hi. I'll, I'll come play with you in a little while. <laughs> all right, bud. High five. So, all right, see ya. Bye. So I think their priority right now. Go to the park. All right, we'll go to the park later. It's a nice day. Okay. I think, I think, um, you know, they're they're focusing their priorities in the right spots. They got to release Arthurian legends. They got to get on a release cadence. There's a lot of um, second order dependencies with uh, suppliers and partners. You know, they're dealing with uh, the factory. It's in China. You got Chinese New Year. You're dealing with every year, which has seemed to, to throw a wrench in things. You got the logistics of like how you distribute the product. Um, you know, so beta was the first. So Kickstarter was essentially direct to consumer, you know, and they had some supply chain partners. But then for beta was the first time they went through mainstream distribution, um, both in uh, the US and in Europe, which is a major undertaking. Maybe you could argue maybe they should have started exclusively in the U S and then figured out how to deal with Europe. I think there's a lot of challenges going international out of the gate. Um, but the Kickstarter was open worldwide. I guess, you know, that was important to them and it's great. Like, I think that's really enhanced the community because there's people from all over the world, super passionate about the game. Um, very much so in Europe, uh, with the people that I've discovered, but you know, they got to work out logistics, supply chain, marketing, uh, community engagement, you know, they're, they, they took on a lot all at once. They got the Cardi IO program. They got, they went to TCG player with the release of beta. Um, they announced that they were trying to launch the dust system, which is like a interesting concept in theory, but obviously there's a lot of logistic challenges in that with, um, managing product, you know, like it's people turn it into code. So there's like an IT aspect to it. And then there's going to be a whole logistical aspect, um, of collecting, cost for shipping and then um, mailing that stuff out to people. It's not trivial. So they got a lot on their plate. And I think um, tournament play is in a big priority. I think the community is doing a great job stepping up this year. There's some major events all over the world, you know, Australia. Um, there's talks of an event potentially in Europe that'll take shape. I know the Italians, you know, my Italians out there just did like a couple. And uh, in the U.S., the, the Court is in Cup coming up. You know, you got March of the Mortals, the Drews running down south in texas the guys out in sort you know doing sorcery con on the west coast um so the community's doing a great job at that and i think it's enough for now um i think the game's in high enough demand where that isn't a critical priority <laughs> don't exclude europe all right <clears throat> let's see changing factory one <laughs> uh, i don't i don't know i mean there's no talk of changing the factory they said that they take quality control seriously i know there was like so there were measures taken for quality control. I think Eric has made trips out there. There's only so much you can do, right? I mean, it's like uh, you're not the one like running the machines, right? You can like stay your demands and your expectations, but you lose control at some point. Uh, they mentioned they made an investment in printers and equipment there. Um, it's, it's hard to measure, you know, how well that worked out because that was pre-alpha release. Um, the, the alpha product is very nice. We were pretty happy with it. You got the typical things with grid lines and things like that. All TCGs have those types of issues. They don't come out of the box as pristine tens or whatever the hell <clears throat> grading nuances. I mean, but it's a very nice product. The alpha product was great. Supposedly the beta is like an improved quality, but some people weren't as happy with the color tones and, and stuff like that. It looks a little darker and this and that. Um, so maybe they're, I'm sure they're still fine tuning that. I mean, Eric's very meticulous and anal about that. I don't think it's trivial to switch, um, printers. I don't know if they have an interest in switching printers. I think even if they did, it would take time. And for now I would expect they would stick with this printer because they need to figure out supply chain and logistics and really get that streamlined, have better visibility into when things will arrive and all the different facets of that from printing to packaging to shipping to getting through customs all over the world and nuances of how every anyone that's shipped on any kind of scale is dealt with freaking customs and the way they 
micromanage things and inspect and ask for documentation. Um, you know, it can, it, it, it's different in different places. And this, I don't think this company has like a lot of experience in that realm. I think they're learning that. That's just my observation. I could be wrong, but um, I think those are their priorities and they're going to have to, they're going to work that before they consider a printer change or anything like that is, would be my guess. <clears throat> an announcement of an announcement for the dust system. They, they announced that the, I can't remember if they said that they would roll out the dust system with beta release, or if they were going to announce the dust system, what happened was they announced the dust system and we don't yet have the dust system. <laughs> so it's theoretically in place. This, this, the worst, there's two things that are, are, uh, unfortunate about that. One, I still find people don't know the dust system exists. So I think something could be done. I don't know what, I think they, there should be some emphasis to say like, please don't throw out your boxes. Like as many, every opportunity you get, remind people that this dust system ex exists and that you can submit those codes even though product is not yet av available, you can like rack up your points, right? It's probably, you know, if people are tight on space, they just start tossing shit, right? Recycling, get your codes. Cause I'm finding people don't know the system exists, right? People I know like, well, and they're like, dude, Mike, why didn't you tell me about the dust system? And I was like, how would I know that I need to tell you about something that you don't know? <laughs> how, how do I know what you know or not know? You know, I don't know what people know. It's out there on the website in theory, but yeah, I think that's like one unfortunate thing, people not knowing and those dust codes being lost. And then also the fundamental purpose of the dust system for the company is to get that data, like on where these boxes are winding up, who is opening them. Um, I think there's a lot of power and knowledge of like how the product gets distributed, where it ends up, who and where are they re redeeming these um, codes, you know, data is power when used appropriately, uh, wisely and effectively and strategically, you know, that's why all these companies data AI, uh, in a data sense, data management. I mean, that's the hottest thing in the world in tech right now. It's extremely valuable and data analytics. So it's gotta be used correctly, but it's gotta be structured. Well, people gotta know it exists. Uh, otherwise it's going to be misleading, right? Cause you're not going to get everybody submitting their dust and you're not, you're going to get imperfect and incomplete information. All right. I'll drink some water while you guys think up questions or else I'll go back to the spreadsheet here or the uh, Word doc. Sorcery related questions. So we haven't had any sorcery related questions yet <laughs> from the Word document. There were some in the chat, thankfully. All right. What position would you have, have to be offered at EC Limited <laughs> to quit your current job and do this full time? Mm. There was a time where there may have been an opportunity where I could have done some work with EC, Eric's Curioso. And, uh, you know, like it, in a way it would be a dream. I think it would be extremely fun and exciting. I think there are certain, like I mentioned earlier, skills, talent, and talent gaps, right? It takes a team of people. I'm not good at everything. I'm terrible at some things, but I'm also very good at some things and same with their team members. So I think there are some gaps that I could fill well and would do well. And there's some I'd be absolutely terrible with and they wouldn't hire me for that. Right. Um, but there was a time where I had given that some thought, uh, but ultimately, you know, it would have required giving up. Well, for one, I got like a family of five. I got three kids, right? So financial stability is important, like in having a main job and benefits and stuff, the package would have to be, you know, not like a YOLO leap of faith that would put my family in a precarious position. But beyond that, like equally important to me intrinsically is that I would have to give up working with the artists. And that is uh, fundamentally something that I don't, uh, I, I don't have an interest in doing right now because I think, um, I truly believe that what I'm doing is very, very important for the artists and for the art industry, because I think there's been some unscrupulous uh, representation of artists in the past, it still goes on to this day, like artists being taken advantage of and lowballed and just kind of manipulated, you know, in TCGs, 
um, in sorcery TCG, there's a lot of artists that have never worked in a TCG before. So they don't know the nature of the market, the type of personalities, the type of things that go on, how to even value their work in the context of a TCG. Um, and in some ways, their work uh, can have heightened value and it could be undervalued. I mean, some of these artists, they sell their works outside of sorcery for $10,000 plus, no problem. And people in sorcery want to pay a few thousand. Uh, I mean, in early days, some of the artists were giving away their work like dirt cheap, like, 600 to 800 dollars right and i and i was looking at that i was like why is this happening i mean i looked at their portfolio beyond the game and i knew they were selling their pieces for thousands of dollars and they you know someone would say like oh you know i just didn't think like the tcg market uh worked like that or like that they valued it the same or whatever like all these reasons are like you know in some cases maybe the work wasn't like on par with some some super elaborate piece that they did outside of the game um, but fundamentally, it was a lack of knowledge of how the TCG industry works and um, sometimes bigger than that. Like some just aren't like really business minded and didn't know how to value their work appropriately for like a highly skilled professional um, that's really at the top of their trade craft and, and is doing something uniquely valuable. Um, it's unique, right? It's like any specialized skill craft. It takes a lot of time and years of honing your craft and becoming an expert and um, marketing your brand and all this kind of stuff. So. I think like I help uh, the artists in a lot of ways. And again, like I also think that really helps the collectors because you want the work to be valuable. You want your collection to be valuable and you want it to retain value. And you don't want these artists represented by someone or not represented at all. And, and they just like piss away their work. They're cheap and it never has any value. That's not fun or nice for anybody. You know, there's, value is more than monetary. Sure. Yeah. But like, let's not kid ourselves. Like monetary value feels good too, right? I mean, like if you make an investment in something, you want it to retain its value. If you're never going to resell it, fine. You could just say like, I'm a purist. I just buy it because I love it and I want to display it. I really enjoy owning it. Great. Then you just want to buy it as cheap as possible. You're never going to care. Um, but the reality is like, these are also professionals and they need to make a living. And especially in a one year, one, one set per year release cadence, um, that's going to be a challenge. It's great that they own their copyright because, you know, they can, um, they're gonna have to monetize in other ways if this is if they're going sorcery full time and don't have a lot of other avenues like so selling prints, selling artist proof cards for fair valuation. Um, that's really important to supplement their income as they're waiting like a whole year or longer before they could even reveal their paintings. I mean, there were some paintings that were commissioned in 2018, 2019, 2020 that were not used in Alpha, and the artist can't even show those works of art, let alone sell. So they can't sell them, right? Um, so it's tough, you know, they gotta, they gotta be smart and be savvy, uh, business people. And, um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to, to help in that. And, uh, also to showcase art leverage. It occurred to me that I could leverage my forums to showcase the artists and the artwork on a very grand scale, which is very intrinsically rewarding because these are great people. It's a pleasure to show their work and for more people to appreciate it. And you see, like I've gotten more into altars recently with Vivian Calazans, uh, was the first and there'll be other altarists. Like I'm, I'm looking for up and coming artists, um, to do sorcery altars that, uh, maybe have never had a breakthrough opportunity or a large platform to showcase their work before and, um, help them give them that opportunity, just like Eric did with sorcery and with commissioning, uh, Kayo and Elvira and Marta to do work for this game. Right. So that's the idea with altars. It's not going to be like, hey, let's just take this little guy and draw like a little dragon flying over the relentless crowd. It's got to be a complete. This is the other thing. Like we got to reform the altars industry. You don't like just draw a little thing like cute little frog hanging over the text box or some nonsense because that's disingenuous to the original art and it's derivative of the original art. You know, like I'm into like completely reimagined takes on these cards. So you have the, the name and the mechanic box and then everything is completely changed right oh so <laughs> lose power so completely reimagined art so it's like a it's just a painting on a card form factor with these new altruists that are not in the game that will be the approach and it's a way to showcase the talent of great artists and give them opportunities they don't have today that's that's the best thing i think i could do with um with the things I do. All right.
I know this might hurt a lot of feelings, but I got a jet. Thanks for hanging out with us, Mike. Keep doing what you do, and keep artists and art front center. Game wouldn't exist without them. Good call, Dan. Thank you, man. Have a great day. Frogman. All right, Goat Collectibles 23. How do you see... Oh, you know what? I said I'd... <laughs> I should have been doing this the whole time, guys. What a noob. How do you see sample cards play out for advanced sorcery collectors over the next few years? <laughs> oh, man. I was I was uh, chuckling a little bit because you said advanced sorcery collectors. I assume you mean like high end collectors or something, I guess, because they're like expensive and valuable, or like people that are into more nuanced ways of collecting. Anyways, beside the point, how do you see sample cards play out over the next few years? Well, you know, sample cards are like artist proof cards, are like uncut sheets, are like curio cards. They're a niche segment. They're not the mainstream cards do you get out of the booster box and the packs right so there has to be fundamentally just like any product supply and demand uh, it, it all comes down to demand we know the supply side is fixed there will not be more sample cards they'll they'll always be incredibly rare like unbelievably wildly rare but what matters in valuation is demand you know Sp supply without Daddy. demand means nothing what, what? Uh, I don't think we can today, but we can go to the park later, right? If you're good, you gotta go downstairs. Go, go with mommy. All right, tell mommy oh, instead of stay with you. Daddy, mommy said I cannot go to the park. She didn't. No, no, mommy said we cannot go to Buddy Bees. Oh, well, we'll talk about it after, okay? Okay. All right, all right, buddy. I'll come down a little while. Say hi. Say hi and bye. Hi, bye. To the park. Yeah, we'll talk about it after, right? Hi, bye. All right, hi, bye. <laughs> All right, guys. So, <laughs> well, the fate of sample cards, it's entirely dependent on demand. So supply and demand, here's a funny story, right? Early on, you not, not a lot of people remember this. It was the early days. Not a lot of people in the sorcery. It was like a very small niche uh, within the discords. And... There were a few people that they got early access to sample cards well before the Kickstarter uh, sample cards were disseminated, and they were up on eBay and they sat there for weeks, did nothing, you know, like fifty, hundred bucks, nobody cared, no one bought them at all, right? But then, you know, like it occurred to me, like I don't know, I started like exposing the history of the game, and I was like, this is super fascinating, like how raw this game was early on, you know, it was like. You could tell there was an intense focus on art. The art was incredible, but the gameplay was rough around the edges. It wasn't really refined and needed work. There are a lot of OP cards. You see that like in the sample cards. It's evident, right? And through all the play testing with the community and um, you know the, the, the exhaustive testing that went on for a couple years before Alpha release really improved that and fine-tuned that beautifully in the Alpha set. But in the early days, it was raw. And I just thought it was like super fascinating, the history of not just the art concepts, but the development of the game and what went into that and shaping this game, shaping this business and this product. Um, so the sample cards were like the first and only like printed form of the history of this game, which is great, you know? So I started talking about that. I started writing articles. I started like, um, I wrote like some really exhaustive articles about where sample cards came from and doing YouTube video content, talking about that. And that really brought a lot of awareness to what sample cards are. And I started like auctioning those. I started like an auction um, system, right? For people to access those securely, right? Cause like in a new market, you don't know anybody. Um, sample cards are expensive, they're rare. It's hard to authenticate that they're real. Um, but through like my network of knowing everybody in sorcery, I thought like what better way to have a secure consignment uh, operation and auction platform where people could buy confidently in rare items that they love uh, and have the confidence that they're authentic and real and the provenance, um, which is otherwise difficult to improve, is legitimate. So once that started happening, people were like super into it. The demand was intense and great and what? so through the sample. Jack, you got to go downstairs, buddy. You can't keep coming in here. All right. Too windy. All right, I'll come down. I'll come down when I'm done. If you're good, we'll go. We'll go to the playground. But I can't. Ah, right sweet. Yeah, about thirty minutes. Watch, watch your iPad. And then I got the one. 
Yeah. All right, go. No, Dad. Why do you bike to the park with us? All right. Dad, I'm be faster. All right, I'll race you. Uh, race? All right, go to mommy. No. Go to mommy. Why are you riding your bike? Pure chaos. Pure chaos. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, sample cars became popular. Demand side improved. Valuations improved. And I think like over time, if there is awareness um, as the market grows, I think, you know, people will fall in love with sample cards for the same reason we did. Right. Why wouldn't they? Um, I don't I don't see why that would fundamentally change. I think if we took an interest in it and we're passionate about it and people like discover sorcery and get really passionate about it and fall in love with it. They'll be fascinated with the um, early development aspect of it. I think both the collector side because of the rarity, but the play side because of the nuance and novelty and really interesting early development. Like, wow, I can't believe that card acted that way before, you know, that mechanic or that casting cost or whatever the case may be. All right, we got Filthy Casual up in here and stop the guns. <laughs> All right, did I miss any questions here? Um... Seems to me that EC would benefit from creating a role for you that allows you to continue this work that would position EC as the premier TCG for artists to work with. I mean, I think they're already honestly like realizing that benefit. They're getting that benefit without having to pay me. <laughs> you know, I mean, like I'm making their artists more relevant, uh, providing a platform for them, creating appreciation and value for their work and in turn for the project. And beyond the art too, you know, I've also done research on like what is a curio what is a sample card like the history the evolution of the game all that like helps helps the project just like it helps the artist just like it helps the collector because now your your um collections are more valuable and there's more interest and growing interest and the game's growing more people to play with more people to collect with more people to buy sell trade with all those all those good benefits um all right so do we exhaust all the questions in the chat or did i miss any let's see I think I hit, uh... all right, I think I hit those. So let's go back to the Word document and tell the wife to get the kid under control first. Hang on a second. All right. What should the fifth element of sorcery be? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, did I miss a question? Was it yours, Greg? If I missed it, just uh, please restate it. It's probably a needle in a haystack. What should the fifth element of sorcery be? Mm. I don't know that it needs it, guys, because um, there's like a historical aspect to al alchemy, right? And the four elements. It's just the way it is. Wind, air, water, earth. It's perfect the way it is. It do there doesn't need to be a fifth. Do you plan on risking your claim to being undefeated anytime soon? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm, I think I'm going to go to the quarters and cup, but I'm probably not going to play. I'm probably just going to hang out with the community and have a good time. Um, yeah, maybe that's all. I should. There's going to be other stuff going on there, guys. It's going to be freaking awesome. I can't say. I don't want to leak anything. I don't know like what Ron, the organizer, has announced or not yet, but like... You got to like get to Baltimore in June for the Courtesan Cup final. It's going to be sick, all right? There's going to be more more than just uh, gameplay going on, all right? Uh, I'm going to go there. Other people from the community are going to be there. It's going to be it's going to be a big deal. And it's the first time ever. I know Gen Con's also going on this summer and people got a budget and can only take off so much time. It's on the weekend. No big deal. I'll go up Saturday and Sunday. I'll stay in a hotel Saturday night, I guess. And then, uh, you know, we'll hang out. We'll have a great time. You, you got to get out there, you know? You just got to get out there. All right, dark side question. How has sorcery protected the product against fraud? Any concerns about fake cards? Just a matter of time, if not already, with increased popularity. <clears throat> I really have no idea. I think, um, I want to say maybe Simon in the discords or someone from the company might have said that there were measures that have been taken and or will be taken. It's something they're aware of, right? And they're conscious of, um, but it's something they can't disclose. And they've said this and it makes perfect sense. They can't disclose what those measures are because that just empowers 
bad actors to exploit it, you know? Um, so it's kind of like a catch 22, you know, there probably is something and we might not be aware of it. Uh, now you could argue if you don't tell the community what that is, there's no way for us to protect ourselves, which is also true. So it is, it is, uh, it's a bit of a dilemma. It's one of those, it's the nature of the business in a way. Um, I don't know. I think the community is smart and scientific people out there, you know, they analyze these things. They tend to find, figure it out with time. And I expect uh, nothing different in sorcery. It's probably going to happen. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. I know Jurgen on the Nerd and Proud of It channel um, did some videos on that topic. I don't, I, I don't know that I've seen them all. Um, but go check out his channel, Nerd and Profit, Proud of It. I think he touched on that a few times. If I told my wife to get anything under control, my wife would assault me. <laughs> I'm risking it all for you guys. All right, Filthy Casual. The fifth element within Esoterica is Akasha Spirit. However, the game doesn't need a fifth. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you need a fifth. All right, art specific. What percentage of original art do you have in an unframed state? <laughs> Guys, you don't want to know, man. I got so much unframed art, it said. The only framed art I have is the ones that came framed. I got the uh, the Karkemish Chimera from Gadu Duasso, and I have the Season Sellsword is framed from Lindsay Crumet, and I got like a lot, uh, a lot of others not framed yet. <coughs> a lot of work to do, and a lot of like prints and embellished prints and different things that I collect. It takes time. And like I am a little, uh, I it gives me a little anxiety trying to figure out how to lay out the walls and do the framing right. I don't know. I just haven't done it yet. All right. What other artists would you like to see join Sorcery in Arthurian Legends? That's a good question. I mean, like I said earlier, I think licensing work from Keith Parkinson as a curio would be really cool to build upon that idea of like an iconic artist. Also, that connection from Guardian CCG, the guy that created it and the guy that did a lot of great art for it and beyond it, incredible artwork. I think he has some great stuff. If there's going to be an Angels and Demons set, which is widely speculated, I mean, his stuff was like resonates so hard with that. Um, other artists, you know what? Like, I don't know if this is a cop out answer, but like, I want it to be artists that I don't know exist. You know, like I've discovered many artists through sorcery that Eric has discovered from like all kinds of genres. Some I figured out how he found them. Some I don't know. Like Severin and Andrea Modesti. I Probably Modesti, he did some RPG type stuff, I think, early on or um, board game type art. So he probably had something as a kid that like had Modesti art on it. Um, but that's like the good stuff, guys. Like discovering a new artist that we didn't know existed and falling in love with their work for the first time. I think it's great to have a mix of like, I thought it was really smart to identify some of the early TSR artists and Magic the Gathering artists that have like that stylistic throw, throwback vibe that takes you right back to the early 90s. Um, trying to, on a business level, trying to capture the imagination of the old school and vintage magic type people that strongly resonate with that and all of us that are like middle age now and remember that from early in life, childhood, teenage years, whatever it was. <coughs> but also balancing that with discovery of new artists, giving up and comers a chance, the MTG alters artists, um, heavy metal album cover artists, expanding the genre beyond your traditional fantasy TCG artist into new artists from other genres really makes this project well, well rounded and very diverse, very special, um, which I think is really tremendous and make is part of like one of the secret ingredients that makes sorcery so unique and special and significant on an art level. So I want to see new artists that I haven't discovered. I don't want to tell Eric like, Hey, go find this guy. That guy's got great art. This lady, their art's already out there. So find new artists, just go out. He, he did this. He went out on Instagram. He went out on, um, art station and he found people like Vasily Ermolayev and, uh, Mikhail Nagypal. Um, Man, I'm probably missing like too many. True at Parish. I mean, he just discovered these guys on the internet. He didn't even he didn't know them himself. The, the artwork resonated with him. It, it uh, filled a vision he had for the game, and I want to see more of that. As much of that as possible. Not retreads. Not like people that are already like super famous and on a big platform. Like that's awesome too. Great. Do that to some extent. Um, with like 25, 30, 40 percent of the artists, maybe 50. 
and then give us the new stuff and bring back the existing artists that we already love. Like, let's see more work from them. You know, we get to experience it, enjoy it through the artist proofs, but keep, keep pushing the envelope and, um, keep commissioning them. It's great. All right. How can sorcery continue to evolve from an art perspective? That's the way guys keep being, uh, stylistically diverse. Don't bring on new artists that have the same similar style as the existing, um, few dozen of artists that we already love you know we're already getting great art from them just get more of it and then supplement it augment it with new artists with new styles that are very different you know diversity is key in all aspects of life all right what kind of non-sorcery art do you dig not that jack you gotta go downstairs buddy you can't be on the camera it's a violation all right it's a violation. Sergey and Larry don't like that. This is creepy. Yeah. All right. What kind of non sorcery art do you dig? I don't know, man. It's kind of like off topic. <laughs> I, You know what I like? I like going on Instagram, just kind of scrolling through. I wasn't a big Instagram guy before or even Facebook. You know, I've been discovering like these, uh, man, like uh, Mark Majori and um, some of these like, I guess because I was into him, I've been finding a lot of this like Western art. Uh, and I really like like the scenic beauty of it, like the horses, just kind of like the throw. I like kind of like that country vibe, you know, like it's quiet. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's like a loner mentality, but it's just like very scenic and beautiful. That's what I, I love the landscape art. So I really love Modesti, does beautiful artwork. Um, so a lot of that resonates with me. I don't know. I don't I, I don't want to say like a lot of like specific artists per se. But like you just scroll down, just go, just go spend some time on Instagram. There's, there's tons of incredible artists all over the place out there. What are your favorite pieces of art from other TCGs? Yeah. Similar type response there. What artists do you want to see contribute to art to the game? Same deal. So I already kind of addressed that new ones, new ones that I don't know. That's my number one, uh, interest category and more art from the same artist that, that we're, we've discovered through sorcery already through alpha and beta. All right, guys, the kids want me to play with them. We're about an hour and a half in. If there's any last minute questions, I'll take another couple and then um, we'll wrap it up for today. We had a pretty good turnout. Not bad, like 20 to 30 people. Really appreciate everybody that um, took the time today to come out and ask questions and hang out. If you if you enjoyed it, please um, hit the like button on the video. If you thought it was garbage, don't, don't bother with the like button. <laughs> no one else should see this. <laughs> Put others out of their misery. But if you did have fun and you enjoyed it, um, do like the video and subscribe to the channel and, um, you know, share the video and uh, put a comment in there. It always helps to have comments. Put a comment in there and uh, let me know what you liked and didn't like about it, how we can do it differently next time. Where is Marco's Alpha, fo alpha Foil Stone? You don't have an Alpha Foil Stone? I, I pull those like uh, like candy, like uh, Halloween. Like uh, I pull that like a Snickers out of the... Uh, the jack-o'-lantern tub. No big deal. <laughs> I, I, I'm averaging like, uh, uh, what, what's, the, let's see, 10, 10, 5, 7, 8, 4. I don't know, man. Like 5% of boxes, I'm pulling the foil of stone. No big deal. 2 out of 30? What's that? What's that equate to? <laughs> That's my pull rate on, on foil phylos. I pulled two of them on the channel in like 30 boxes. Unbelievable. All right, guys, there were some good questions out there. I'm glad I asked for questions beforehand because there wasn't a lot of chatter in the um, in the channel today. But uh, thank you guys all for being here. Um, there's there's a lot of fun, exciting stuff coming up. Um, there's going to be new artists discovered, alterists who are going to be given a stage on the Sorcery Community Group in the Collector Art House Discord. So please join those forums. Like in the links of all my videos, there's a link tree. You can join all the... Um, platforms and community groups and forums that I've created. Uh, we'll take a look at March of the Mortals next week. Um, and then the Courtesan Cup. There's a Courtesan Qualifier next week at Flights 2 Games in Albany, New York. I'm glad I remembered to give Crazy Dave Sheedy a shout out. That's a real cool store up in Albany, New York. It's a qualifier. And then the main event, I think it's June 14 to 16 in, in Northern Maryland. In the outskirts of Baltimore, it's going to be epic, guys. It's going to be a great time. Come out there. Let's meet in person and hang out. Whatever trade, maybe I'll bring some art or some like unique stuff, artist proofs, and uh, 
cards to show. It'll be, it'll be a great time. Um, on the channel, I love doing lives. There'll be more lives to come. Um, you know, follow my efforts. If you want to join my Patreon or follow the channel, like, subscribe, do whatever. Whatever you like to do, do it. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for being here, guys. I'll see you.